So, what's a weed? Uh, it's a plant out of place, basically. You can call it other things, maybe not repeatable in public, but a weed com competes for light water and nutrients. And y'all have been hearing about insects and diseases and whatever, but there's weeds out there too that are important. And um, so don't forget about them, because they, they have other um, issues that you need to be concerned with. So harvest interference, this is a big old mass of cut leaf nightshade. Um, there's even direct tuber damage, um, rhizomes from quack grass that are, have actually grown into tubers. And as Eric mentioned, uh, weeds can host pests uh, that are de detrimental to insect, uh, such as insects, disease, and nematodes. And one of the interesting things is hairy nightshade hosts uh, PBY that uh, Eric was talking about, and the vector green pea chicken. In fact, the aphids like the hairy nightshade better than they like the potatoes. Um, there are uh, different different kinds of weeds: annual, uh, summer annual, winter annual. Um, just go through this real quick. Um, the winter annuals uh, germinate in the fall and then flower in the spring and, and get done. Um, early summer. And the biennials actually grow for two years. First year they would uh, come up with the rosette and then flowering and during the second year. So some of the common uh, weeds and potatoes and the broadleaves and grasses, uh, pigweed, lamb's quarter, hairy nightshade, which is my favorite weed. Um, others, Russian thistle, common purslane, and then the grasses, um, green fox scale, wild oat, and the volunteer small grains that you've seen. So speaking of hairy nightshade or any other kind of weed, weeds can cause 75% total yield loss from competition for that air, light, and water thing. The quality can also be lost. Um, US number one tubers uh, without defects four ounces or greater in size is what is desired, and less than four ounces are called culls, and the culls can also be malformed or misshaped like uh, Eric was talking about. You also can get more US number twos that have slight defects, but the processor contracts are based on not only yield, but as quality as well. And there's a premium paid for uh, the eight to 10 ounce uh, supersized crunch rice type of tubers. So just jumping into some of the tactics here, um, the best strategies to manage weeds and crops are established on a Concepts of diversity, just like uh, whatever everybody talks about. You can see the co-joining circles now on the right. Um, but what they are covering is mechanical, cultural, and biological practices in addition to herbicides. And then when you do uh, use herbicides, make sure you use different kinds of herbicides um, that not only control the different weeds in there, but you have more than one herbicide controlling the same weed. And so a combination of those tactics uh, reduces uh, the selection process uh, imposed by any of the single practices. So mechanical herbicides, um, mechanical would be the tillage of course, uh, pre-plant, uh, hand rolling, equipment sanitation, even chaff collection at the um, end of your weed combine and that'll catch the weeds that are out there. Herbicide tank mixes, like I said, uh, sequential and then across seasons. And the mechanical plus herbicides um, really, I'll, and I'll emphasize this later, is a timely cultivation and healing uh, followed by pre-emergence paint mixtures. And there's cult cultural, which is very important. Um, crop rotation, uh, competitive healthy uh, potatoes, green manure crops, and some other as well. Um, there are uh, biocontrol in uh, for weeds. On the left here is mustards, and we did a study at the Aberdeen Research and Extension Center where um, if you had manure, a green manure, you pull it down, plow it down in the fall, uh, it would reduce hairy nightshade biomass um, the next spring uh, because of the glucosinolates that uh, the mustards put out. It, it, it kind of uh, did something to germination and reduced the um, biomass. And there's other things out there too, uh, electronic zappers, 
um, good old fashioned hoeing um, and flamethrowers, which they do use in some large cropping areas. Okay. So cultural, you want to manage the crops through crop, uh, weeds through crop rotations and plant competitive crops. And it might be easier to control a weed in your rotation crop than it is in potatoes. And irrigate maybe after your winter wheat, and then you can uh, make some of the weed seedlings come up and maybe control them with tillage or herbicides after that. And you want to, like I said, plant competitive potato varieties. Uh, for instance, Russet Burbank, larger plant can canopy, uh, Russet Narcota, smaller static stature, and it doesn't always close over the rows. So you need more management in the, in the Russet Narcota. So one of the, the trials that we also did was with hairy nightshade, uh, we found that the one hairy nightshade per meter row, meter row uh, present from emergent Saharas reduced rusted narcotic toll yields by 16%, and it needed two per uh, meter row in the uh, rusted bur burbanks, and the, the reduction still wasn't as high as in narcotas. And in narcotas, it's ap absolutely necessary to have. Uh, weed free from 7 to 22 days after, between the, that period after emergence, or you're going to lose at least 5% yield. So, uh, mechanical, a little bit more on that. Cultivation pluses and minuses. Cultivation less expensive, uh, no chemical residues, and wind is not an issue unless you're in Idaho in a really bad windstorm. Uh, <laughs> cultivation minuses, uh, soil compaction. Uh, there's been studies done where they sh we've shown root pruning and crop injury. Uh, if you have heavy infestations, you might need multiple cultivations. Uh, what soil, it can't get out there timely. Uh, you can't control the weeds in the plant row. And that uh, equipment might spread some disease, and that's important, especially in uh, seed areas. Okay, herbicide pluses and minuses. Herbicide is effective. It's usually faster to spray than to cultivate, and you often can get by with the, the right tank mix and um, just one single application. The negatives would be environmental safety concerns, others potential for crop injury, uh, carryover plant back restrictions, and of course the cost. And speaking of herbicides, these are all of the herbicides that are labeled in potatoes, and I won't go through it all, but uh, we have ones that you put on pre-plant or pre-emergence, uh, pre-emergence only, and then some that you can put on after the potatoes come up, and then some that only work um, post-emergence to the weeds. So application methods, aerial or ground, and then incorporate, we're lucky here to have sprinkler incorporation, can also apply uh, chemigation. Like I said, there's different timings, pre-plant incorporated, pre-emergence to the crop or the weed, and then post-emergence to the crop or the weed. So in potatoes, the biggest thing is cultivation of herbicides, and that combination is what's really important, um, definitely in potatoes. So in potatoes, a healing, you'll hear that, and that's cultivation with the equipment that throws the soil up out of the furrow uh, into the rower area, and it forms a hill, uh, and this is done after you plant, and you want to cover up those potatoes so you don't get greening later in the season, and it's a nice place for tubers to grow. And it should be the last tillage operation in the field because if you've already sprayed herbicides down, you're going to break that herbicide barrier, bring up non treated soil, and then also weed seeds. So uh, there's equipment called, the, you'll hear people calling it dammer diker, and that's um, actually reservoir tillage. It builds, um, puts divots in the soil, and that helps with um, irrigation to conserve water and um, make it infiltrate a little bit slower. And then some of uh, like adapted a boom on the back of their cultivator, uh, so they're spraying and cultivating at the same time. And then others use a sprayer that can actually float over the divots. So you can hill it, you can uh, make those divots, and you can get out there and spray your pre-emergence and then uh, incorporate. So just as uh, Eric mentioned weed identification, you want to keep field histories. You can do map, mapping of weed infestations, real simple drawings, or you might all have drones now. Uh, and that way you can conduct site-specific weed control if 
if you do have that kind of thing out in your fields or spray the whole field if that's what you see. So I just want to go over real quick three scenarios that grower, potato growers use. Uh, plant hill and spray in the same operation. You plant and then you do uh, an operation called drag off before potato emergence and then you do the healing and herbicide application after potato emergence. And the one that um, most growers use around here is that they plant and then they have healing and herbicide application um, pre-emergence to the potatoes. So first one, uh, well just a minute, you know, I'll tell you here. Usually after planting you have about three to four weeks where there's nothing that potatoes haven't come up yet, weeds may be coming up. And then four to five weeks or so after that, you get the potatoes closing on the rows, and uh, that helps absolutely with competition against, against the weeds. So plant, hill, and spray at the same time. Um, and all the herbicides, and I showed you on that one slide, they're all labeled for this timing. Get that three to four weeks, potato emergence, and then up to row closure. And, but you need that season-long control with those herbicides that you've sprayed. Um, all the way back, you know, two or three months earlier. And what if weeds come up after herbicide application? Well, you might have to go into pre-emergence and uh, there's some herbicides that are labeled even uh, Roundup or burn down uh, with AIM and then herbicides after emergence like Matrix or Metabrism that can kill a lot of the weeds that uh, would come up after potato emergence. So when you're spraying though, you can't, you really want to spray uh, weeds that are not bigger than two inches. So this is just about right, and these are too big. So that second scenario, you drag off, you flatten the ground of the hills that the planter made, um, and then you hill and spray after potato emergence. So you're not blind cultivating, is what some people call it. And you don't want to wait too long after emergence to heal uh, because some weeds will get covered up uh, when you heal and then they'll come back out on the sides of the hills or you just won't get them if they're, they're too big. So you only can use herbicides though that don't hurt the potatoes because that's all you're doing is spraying after potato emergence. And there are others that don't have foliar activity but you can still use them and the, you'll get some soil uh, activity throughout the season. So this is one, like I said, that a lot of growers use. They plant and then before potato emergence, they hill and then they spray. And then the potatoes come up and they have that five uh, weeks or so with the uh, crop starting to compete. And this is a good deal um, because that healing takes out any weeds that are there as long as they're small. And if you get those herbicides on, then um, that's great, but sometimes you might need a foliar activity uh, herbicide, just like uh, what we needed with that first scenario. So you're out there healing uh, uh, with the uh, dammer diker, and then you're spraying floating over it with the, these big spray floaters. So now we have a shorter interval. Um, uh, herbicides can last longer. Again, you can spray post-emergence if you need to. Um, And, but again, cultivation timing with the herbicide is really critical. And it's sort of like uh, with healing, you need to, um, with spraying, you need to make sure that the weeds aren't too big. Okay, so post-emergence, you want to time them to the correct growth stage, um, and then that help maximize weed control and crop safety, and make sure the weeds aren't under any stress or else the herbicides won't be taken up and they won't really work that well. You want to keep the borders of the fields clean, um, especially because some insects and whatever can hang out in the, the borders and wait for your potatoes to come along. Always read and follow the label. The label is the law. You've heard that before. Uh, you want to know varieties, sensitivities of some of the herbicides. Make sure you're putting on the right herbicides, the right rates, uh, incorporation, and apply it like I was showing you at the optimum growth stage and then tank mixing. Uh, is highly recommended. And as you know, there's more than one species of weeds in the field. And we've just um, published recently here an extension bulletin, and uh, I'll show you just a couple excerpts of that. 
but it helps you figure out uh, what tank mixtures that you can use. So you have a choice chart and you can put in the weeds that you have. Let's say we picked a uh, hairy nightshade, red root pigweed, lamb's core, kosher, and wild oat. And then you put in the control measures. Um, and you can get these from a lot of different sources. Uh, good is greater than 90 percent, fair 80, 80 to 90, and uh, partial or none. So let's just rub out the kosher. And here's I'm um, circle the ones that are good for each, each of those three weeds. Now I'm going to put together appropriate tank mix. Um, so I'm going to pick just the chateau. You see the name on the left. <coughs> I got that to reason which a lot of people use. Um, but I also want to put a third one in there, Linux, so I have more than one herbicide control in the same weeds. And then you can see over on the right that most of these uh, do control the grasses out there, and um, even the two uh, metribuzin and linear on that I've, I've used. So, what does that look like? Um, so, metribuzin controls the lamb's quarters, not the hairy nightshade. Uh, you could use Outlook, but that doesn't control the lamb's quarters. Uh, a tank mix of that, you know, you get 100% seasonal and control. Um, but you do want that overlapping control with three-way tank mix like what I was showing you. Uh, you get different mechanisms of action, which I didn't go into. Uh, here's two different, and that helps you with the uh, lamb's quarters. And then you put the Linux in it controls both lamb's quarters and the hairy nightshade. So you've got the overlap. And remember, again, this is uh, part of a program where we're trying to get all this information out to our constituents um, through our IPM extension implementation, implementation program. Uh, there are other uh, extension bulletins that you can find uh, more than the, nine, the one I just uh, put out. Get on uh, Cal's UI to vote and then go to their online catalog.